Jamaica. Best decision ever. Feel the sand between your toes and the gentle waves of the sea on your skin. Feel the warm Jamaican breeze lift your spirits and nourish your soul. Escape to exactly what makes your heart beat. You will love every moment. Jamaica. Heartbeat of the world. Let's go. Cuando me abrazan tus olas y despiertan tus aromas Me gusta, me gusta Tus paseos, me gusta Descubrirte, me gusta Tus secretos, todo en ti me gusta It all. Welcome to day three of the Caribbean Literary Conference, CARICON 2022. I'm your host, award-winning journalist and Caribbean correspondent, Melissa Noel. Over the past two days, we have explored different aspects of Caribbean literature and heritage. Today, we continue to explore those collaborations made to build on the way forward. On today's schedule, we start our workshops with Shailene Bishop and crafting compelling characters. At 11 a.m., we have Dr. Joan Marks with Publish Your Poetry and Andrea Loney with your personal pathway to traditional publishing. Jennifer Vassell is up at 12 noon with How to Identify Your Niche Audience, followed by Dr. Horace Alexander, who kicks off our afternoon sessions with How to Write Historical Fiction. Then Melissa Shepard Williams will share the healing power of Afro-Latino music. At 1.30 p.m., Dr. Eleanor Wintz and her team of panelists discuss Together We Rise, Race, Diversity, and the Caribbean Experience. Then I'll be back at 2.30 p.m. with our closing ceremony. But first, let's get started with Jacqueline Bishop for a conversation with Monique Rofi, author of Mermaid of Black Conk. Jacqueline, please take it away. Hello, hello. I'm about to, um, 
Hi, I'm just going to introduce this session. Good, good morning. Uh, welcome to our first session of the day, a conversation with Monique Ruffy, the mermaid of the Black Conk. This session is scheduled for approximately 45 minutes with some additional time for questions at the end of the session. Uh, attendees, microphones and cameras are disabled during the session, but you may type in the chat or Q&A sections on the right hand side of the screen. And you can also use the emojis at the bottom of the screen as well. Um, and now a little, bit about, a little bit about our speaker. Born in Jamaica, Jacqueline Bishop is now based between Miami and New York City. She is a writer and visual artist and author, most recently of The Gift of Music and Song, interviews with Jamaican women writers. Her book, The Gymnast and Other Positions, was awarded the 2016 OCM Focus Award in Nonfiction. She has published a novel and two collections of poems. As a visual artist, she has had exhibitions in several countries. Awards she has received include the Canute A. Broadhurst Prize for short story writing, a year-long Fulbright grant to Morocco, and a UNESCO Fulbright Fellowship to Paris, a Brown Foundation Dora Mar Visual Arts Award. She is an associate professor at the New York uh, University. Please welcome our moderator for this session, Jacqueline Bishop. Uh, Jacqueline, you're muted. Hi, Jacqueline. Look at the bottom of your screen. There's a red button. The little uh, microphone button. The uh, microphone button at the bottom. All the way at the bottom of the screen. Hello? Hello? Yes, we hear yes, you now. Perfect. You know. Well, there was a sign up on it. I, I, you know, that just said we are, you're backstage and that sign never came down. Um, so I'm sorry about that. But anyway, um, welcome, welcome. I'm happy to be um, interviewing my dear friend Monique Ruffy. This is the latest iteration of her book. And I'm just going to start by um, telling us a little bit about who Monique Ruffy is. Monique Ruffy was born in Port of Spain, Trinidad. She's the author of six novels and a memoir. The Mermaid of Black Conk won the Costa Book of the Year and the Costa Novel Award 2020. Um, it was shortlisted for various prizes, short and long listed. Um, and she's a very, very acclaimed writer uh, with several books that we're gonna talk about today. Um, the Trist and with the Kisses of Her Mouth among them. Monique Ruffy is a senior lecturer at the Manchester Writing School at Manchester Metropolitan University and a tutor for the National Writers' Center. She lives in the East End of London. So welcome, Monique. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Welcome. So, Thank you, Jacqueline, for yeah. such a warm welcome. And we are dear friends as well. So it's lovely to be here with you. Uh, um, so, Monique, congratulations on all the accolades that the Mermaid of Black Conk has received. Um, I was there from the very earliest of days. Um, I can remember you fundraising and trying to get this book out into the world. Um, and worried about whether it would find its place, and it did. You know, that's the power of the story and the power of the mermaid. Um, I want to start at a moment of definition and clarification. So I will begin by asking you, Monique, who am I speaking to? Who is Monique Ruffy? That's a great question. <laughs> a great question. Now, I'm going to confess that myself and Jacqueline had a little conversation this afternoon and I had I've written I've actually written the answer down so I'm going to read my answer which is I'm a middle-aged woman I'm binational I'm bicultural 
I'm Caucasian, but Caribbean in awareness and consciousness. I'm a 21st century European Caribbean intersectional feminist and novelist. And any more? I can keep going. My books are full of myth and magical realism, and yet they tell stories in a contemporary setting. And uh, yeah, I'm a writer, I'm a writer. And an activist too, I think. I am, yes, yes. Very much. So Monique, story. when did you realize you were a writer and what was the process like of getting published? Um, oh. mm -hmm. I, I hate, I'm, this is gonna sound really, this is gonna sound a bit pretentious, but I've been, well, I was born, I'm a born writer. I was, I was writing like as a child. I've been writing all my life. And I started writing um, when I was a very small child. And I used to write on the walls all over the house. And I used to write on the furniture. And then I graduated up to writing little journals when I was a child, um, which my mother once found. And they were all about how much I hated her. And she's never forgiven me or forgotten that. And then... Um, and then I was a journalist in my 20s, and I quickly, quickly found journalism very formulaic, and I grew out of it quite quickly. And then one day I just thought to myself, I'm going to be an author, a writer, writer. And not one single person, when I, I announced it to all my friends that I was going to be a writer, writer, in my early 30s. And every nobody was impressed <laughs> nobody was impressed and um so i've been it was a slow i think most writers when they decide they're going to make that shift have to find a way um, of turn, turning themselves into a publishable writer so there was a long period of apprenticeship i think I think I can hear myself, I'm afraid. I can hear myself on the loop. Anyway, there's a bit of echo on the line. Um, if there's anyone who can fix have, that, maybe. I have one suggestion. If Jacqueline, if you turn down your volume a little bit, it may help. Okay, so I'm afraid to touch anything. Um... That's better. Hang on, that's better. That's better. A little bit yeah. better. Well, I didn't touch anything. <laughs> I can hear my voice on Jacqueline's computer. That's what's happening. I think that's what it is. So if you have a way to turn down your volume a little bit, Jacqueline, that might help. Yeah, or you can mute while she's talking. That, that helps. Mm -hmm. Okay, so basically um, there was a period of apprenticeship where I did an MA in creative writing and a PhD. And then um, I did loads and loads of classes just like everybody else does. And then early on I was about 35 I found an agent you know in the way that people do but again you know this is such a long time ago that it's pre the internet when I was agented so in those days you had to write letters you had to try and meet people it's very different when I first started there wasn't the kind of world that we have today um, like I said you wrote you wrote letters um, you received letters, you had fax machines. It was a slow process of, 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 of working in my early years. You had floppy disks, you didn't have email, you know. That, so I've been writing for 25 years. So early on, it wasn't like it is today. And then slowly, slowly, I found the agent that I've got now. So tell us about some of your early... Um published works and then we'll just go into from after that you reading a little bit from the mermaid of black black conk um okay my debut novel um is about um a young man who um basically metamorphosizes into himself he turns it's an ex my first so all my books seem to um, involved magical realism, which has always been a great surprise to me that I'm a magical realist. It's not something I've ever tried for. It's just happened. So the first book is, a, it was on the back of being seriously ill myself in my 30s. My early 30s, I became seriously ill with an autoimmune illness. So I, I look back at my first, my first um, book, it's called um, Sundog, and it's about a 
young man who sort of coming of age finds himself um, becomes a tree in the process metamorphosis you know Kafka esque kind of set in the set in London. Um, my second novel is a biographical book called The White Woman on the Green Bicycle, which really looks at um, what my family, how my family came to the Caribbean, what on earth they were doing there. And it started my mother once, I was like chopping onions and I'm like, you know, 30 something. And my mother's a great raconteur and tells me tons and tons of stories. And then one day she said, oh, yes. And when we arrived, they came on a banana boat in the 50s. No, we just had two suitcases and my green bicycle and I was like what <laughs> you know what you brought a bicycle to Trinidad are you mad are you crazy and um so that I wrote the white woman on the green bicycle down on a piece of paper and I put it in the back of my filofax to this day I still use filofaxes and that was it and then years later I wrote that and then there have been other novels set in the region there's a book called Archipelago which happened after my brother's house was seriously flooded and it's a kind of eco ecological novel set in the region and then I've also written about the coup in 1990 and and I've also written a couple of sexy books or I would say sex lit sex fiction I've written um a memoir and I've written the fictional version of the memoir called The Tryst and uh there's so much to say about my sexy books that's a whole other that's a whole other thing but um so i've written quite a lot i seem to have written quite a lot in in the last 10 15 years okay so let's hear about have you read from the mermaid of black Kong? okay so i'm gonna read um a tiny bit from the beginning of the book um so some american fishermen have come to Black Conk, and they are coming to, to you know, um, catch the big fish. And many, many years ago, my brother invited me to to go out on his boat one Saturday, and he had a friend. He had he was entertaining a colleague from America, and I said yes. And uh, I found myself stuck on a boat with this American man who, who wanted to kill himself a tiger, and I was just so. These men who I'm writing about are, are based on this man that I, this terrible man that I, I read, I, I met once. So they've they've gone out. They've got local crew. They've hooked something. They know they've got a big fish. They don't know what it is. They haven't seen it yet. So I'm just going to read a little bit from when they first realise what they've caught. The thing's about to come up, shouted the father. Son of a goddamn bitch, it's coming up. Keep your rod up. The flat dark sea broke open. The mermaid rose up and out of the water, her hair flying like a nest of cables, her arms flung backwards in the jump, and her body glistening with scales and her tail flailing, huge and muscular like that of a creature from the deepest part of the ocean. She beat up and out, arcing through the air, so she flipped on her back. The men saw her head, her breasts, her belly, the pubic bone of a woman where it met the tail of a glistening fish. Jesus Christ! exclaimed Thomas Clayson. Nicer crossed himself. The black conch men gasped. Cut the line! shouted Nicer Country. Cut the goddamn line! All five men were horrified as she hit the water thrashing. Her mouth was bloody and she'd only just started to fight. On the end of Hank Clayson's rod was a wild creature furious to be so caught. Nicer knew they'd hook something they shouldn't have. He jumped down from the flight bridge with his knife. The mermaid, or whatever it was, deserved to stay in the sea. This wasn't his business at all. The thing looked too big for the boat. It could even take the boat down. Don't do that, shouted Thomas Clayson, as Nicer bent to cut the line. Do not do that. She's worth millions. Millions. We're bringing her in, goddammit. We are bringing her in. She was on the surface now, thrashing like a mako shark, fighting the line with her arms, coughing up blood and spitting and screaming a high wailing song. Oh, God, stammered Hank. Did you see that? His hands were shaking with the rod. The father wanted to take it from him. The blank conch men, Nicholas and Shortleg, backed away from the stern. Like nicer, they knew this was wrong. 
afraid bad jumpy fish get catch. They didn't want to help. They were lost for words for what to do. The white men wanted to pull this creature out of the sea. But this fish was half woman, plain enough. Everyone had heard of the mermen in black conch water. But merwoman? Nah. She carried with her bad luck at best, and her hair frightened them. She could kill with just one lash from those tentacles. She could poison them all. They'd see spikes on her back. Scorpion fish spikes. Dorsal spikes. They had seen a bloody, raging woman at the end of a fishing line. And now these white men, they wanted to bring her in? Nah, boy, they said to themselves. The mermaid was now under the surface again. Younger Clayson's face was full of a terror and excitement. Hold her, shouted the father. What does it look like I'm doing? Um, the son snapped. Keep backing up on it, Thomas Clayson shouted to Nysa. Nysa had begun to see dollar signs. If it had been him alone, he would have thrown her back in the sea. But the talk made him realise that this could make him enough money for another boat, a new car, a small business of his own. Imagine that. He threw the throttle into reverse and slowed the boat down. The engine hummed. Nysa could feel his own curiosity grow. How much could she fetch? He backed the boat slowly onto the fish and the line stopped going out. The younger Clayson was lifting and lowering his rod, lifting and lowering, and the line was coming back onto the reel as fast as he could turn the reel handle. The mermaid had gone back under for now. That thing must weigh like, what, 600 pounds, said Thomas Clayson. The ocean was flat and empty again, and there was silence apart from the sound of the reel ticking over. Did you see her? said Hank Clayson. Hell yes, said the father. Did you see her tits? Said the son. He was so entranced by what he had seen. The court it had loosened his tongue. Hell yes. Did you see her face? Yes. Did you see her arms? Yes. Did you see her pussy bone? All the men nodded at this. We could sell her to the Smithsonian, said Thomas Clayson, or the Rockefeller Institute for research. Line was slowly coming in, and for the next 20 minutes, the men stared hard astern, each calculating what might happen if they caught her, and each feeling a deep, boiling up sensation in his groin. They didn't know what to expect. They kept their eyes on the sea and listened to the reel ticking. She was coming in. But she would fight again. That's it. Ah, uh, that scene, that scene, Monique. You know, um, it's such a powerful scene. Um, and such a painful one as well. When I was rereading it for the book, um, for this interview, when I was rereading the mm -hmm. book for this interview, I wondered why you decided to make your Caribbean mermaid um, a native woman, um, an indigenous woman, as opposed to, say, um, an African woman or a white mermaid. Well, it's the region, it's the Caribbean region, so she wasn't going to be white or European. That was like off the menu. And then with Mami Wata, the um, Yoruba deity, I didn't feel I had permission to work with her and to write her. And I think um, for me, I felt that would open up, um, that would open up possibly, you know, that would open up things that I felt, okay, this isn't, this isn't, this isn't my, um, my world. This is, this isn't for me. And I waited for ages because I had this big dream about a mermaid. And I used to doodle her. I mean, you know, she's kind of crucified, but upside down. I had that image. And I'd seen her on the jetty what, during the comp competition. Um, in fact, um, Jacqueline, I can hear my voice again in your, in your uh, flat. Um, anyway, so um, at some point, like years after my dream, I came across the Taino legend. And it was like, you know how you just kind of like scroll the internet and you're looking at mermaids and Caribbean, da da da. But the thing, the thing that really hooked me, oh, no pun intended, was it's about female jealousy and inside a patri patriarch, ancient patriarchal structure. But she is an, it's about 
So she's a young, pretty, beautiful, talented woman who is irksome to other women and she's banished to live with a crone and that doesn't work and eventually the woman gets so pissed off with her it is in the legend that they get the big goddess jaguar big witch to banish the crone and the maid the maiden and these days i'm 56 and i'm po post menopause i am a crone and i never really woken up to that um until quite recently and i was interested in this idea of getting womanhood right like when do you get to be a woman who's safe that isn't stigmatized that isn't banished you know if you're an older woman you are um invisible and in some way desexualized and aikaia is punished for her sexuality so when i read that story i thought yeah 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 yeah, yeah. now i have a, a a story to rewrite a sort of to revise in a kind of intersexual nor feminist way yeah it was a story i wanted to write or rewrite well the, it you, you bring up so many interesting questions um uh, maybe we should just take a moment and you tell us very quickly um how you came up with the idea to tell this story you were on a jetty you said hmm. oh no so years ago i was in tobago um writing a writing a book you know i was there on retreat writing a book and it was um it was a bleak couple of weeks weather wise it was raining it was rainy season and then at some point there was a fishing competition started to happen it started to materialize in front of me and it was just fascinating you couldn't not be um intrigued because you know it's all men only men own boats by the way so 99% of men of boats are owned by men it's such a big masculine sport um at in charlotteville they have a jetty and at the end of the jetty they have this um I don't even know what it's called, but it's like a, it looks like a lynch, a place to hang the fish that they catch. And, uh, and I, I didn't like the look of that. And then um, it was a strange week weather-wise and there was some, some very eerie things going on in the village. And somebody, some people got lost at sea, etc. And I had this dream one night about the fact that what if these um, fishermen had gone out and come back with a mermaid and that was it. I had that dream for years before I found the story. And I used to draw her in my notebooks, this upside down reverse crucified mermaid. So she stuck with me for a, quite a while before I found the story. Uh, uh, this is a tough question, Monique, that I'm going to ask you. Um, so I want you to kind of prepare yourself. I wondered yeah. if you could talk through the relationship between David Baptiste and the mermaid a little bit. I started mm. to get the uncomfortable feeling that all the black women in the book are rough and brutish. Indeed, David Baptiste notes of St. Constance Island women, they like to cuss and criticize and use more earthly ways to seduce his loins. Mm. The counterpoint to these rough black women is of course, Aikaia, who was, quote, different, and everything about her was, quote, unquote, different. Mm. David is protective of the mermaid and admires um, everything about her, right? However, she's ostensibly a filthy, helpless, yet exotic time of creature. Isn't this feeding into the stereotype of a black man preferring the exotic woman of her own? Um, so, and why aren't black women accorded, or white women for that matter, in the book, accorded the care and attention the mermaid gets by David Baptiste? Okay, so there's quite a lot in there. And um, I would start this by saying that Black Conk is a tiny village. And I think in small villages, and I can hear myself talking again in your, in your, um, in your video, so in tiny villages or small places, this is what I know because I've come from a small place myself, um, as you 
become adolescent and pubescent and interested in sex, um, everybody gets to know each other quite well. Um, you've basically had intimate relations with almost all the people in the village by the time you're 20, in, in your 20s. And in Trinidad, for example, you've probably married everybody. Everybody gets married quite quickly. And so people are related by blood and people have swapped partners and sometimes married couples, you know that their backgrounds are that they have all slept with each other's wives and partners at some point in the mating ritual of adolescence. And I know that's very true of my brother's friends. And I would put myself in that mix as well, because I've definitely also had sexual relations with some very happily married people now. <laughs> um, so that was my feeling about David, you know, that he comes from a small place where they have all known each other sexually, end of. Um, that's my reading of it. Um, with the mermaid, I don't see, I, I'm anti-exotic. I get exoticized myself. I also am foreign with um, foreign looks, uh, curly hair that everybody wants to touch. I've suffered from the same exoticization in, in many ways. I see her in two ways. First of all, I think the white men, they see her as a freak. She's a mermaid, so she's a freak, a freak of nature. But secondly, when she loses her tail and she re-emerges um, as her, who she used to be, she's 3,000 years old or two and a half thousand years old. So she's our, she's a first, our first people. And her consciousness and awareness would be pre-modernity, pre-modern. So um, she just doesn't think like us. She's pre-modern. And there is a, a book that really, really influenced me, which is called The Inheritors by William Golding. And he writes about, um, from the point of view of people who were pre-homo sapien, so Neanderthals. And he, he writes from the point of view of people who were pre-verbal, pre-language. And I, I kind of used some of his ideas around, so Aikaya does write in verse, but, but she doesn't say much. And she's got a transparent relationship with nature, with the natural world, with Reggie, with animals, with trees, she can greet the trees, she looks at everything, the kingdom of the sky, the kingdom of the sea, so she looks at everything differently. Now for David as the lover, who, you know, he, it's, it's interesting because I'm not sure if what he feels for her is Eros in, in the textbook sense that, you, that today we think of Eros, erotic love. I think he has never met somebody like her. She's from a different time. She's from a, a different historical moment in our evolution and so he is completely yeah he's kind of this is someone I'm never I've never met before I I would I don't I, you know when I was writing it I don't think she's as exoticized I had this idea that she would be naked a lot of the time um, because people would not be wearing clothes or covering themselves up they wouldn't have the same understanding of of uh that we would, you know, and um, I wanted her to be very natural. I wanted him to have to deal with that in his modern, in his modern way. Um, reject clothes, find he ha she had to wear clothes, um, cover herself up, lose her innocence a bit. So he's dealing with somebody, he's, he's completely, I'm not even sure if besotted is the right word, but yeah, she's different. She isn't the same as Miss Rain or Priscilla or... Anybody, any of the black or white women in, in, in the book, she's not the same. She's not on the same page. I hope that might answer. Yeah, that's a great answer, yeah. actually. Um, really fantastic. Um, you know, so many Caribbean women writers um, are fascinated with the mermaid or the river mama, or, you know, she goes by various different names in the Caribbean based on what language people are speaking. Mm -hmm. um, I'm thinking now of Lorna Goodison. I'm thinking of Shara McCollum, myself, Monica Minot. Uh, in Guyana, there's Grace Nichols, 
we all seem to come back to this place where you are in this mm-hmm. book with mm-hmm. uh, a mermaid figure. So my question to you is, why do you think so many Caribbean women are drawn to the mermaid? Mm. And secondly, what does this mermaid mean for you, this mermaid figure? Okay, that's a really interesting question. I have lots to say about this. So for two or three things, first of all, she is the quintessential outsider. And she's also an icon of entrapment. She's entrapped. She's an outsider. She's entrapped. She's female. She also has been in some way um, merged with the ocean. Extremely powerful. So we are drawn to her. But secondly, I think up until 100 years ago or 200 years ago, storytelling was owned by men. Okay. All our old stories come from a patriarchy, 12,000 years of patriarchy. And so we've lost a time when women used to tell stories and hand down stories. Um, Pre-monotheic religions, a lot of the old pagan cultures that we all come from, whether it's an African pagan culture or a European pagan culture, where women's voices and women's stories and women's wisdoms were very much part of our received wisdom and uh, about you know stories in general and handed down we we live in a different time you know power is different women have lost their power so i see all of this whether it's caribbean writers or whether it's any other writers you know latin american writers or you know american writers or european writers i see it as a great feminist reclamation of of the mermaid i think we're all reclaiming her Yeah, what I find so fascinating about the mermaid myself is that she lives between worlds, right? Um, She can move, uh, she can be up, right, and be in the world where she uses oxygen, but she's also a creature of the the waters and whatnot. Mm -hmm. Um, And I find that idea of uh, someone who can move between worlds similar to our migrant lives as Caribbean writers, oh, yeah. but even our lives as women within the Caribbean who are mm-hmm. writers. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that's why part of the reason why she speaks so powerfully yeah. to us. Yeah, she sure does. I mean, she's, you know, I, I relate to her so strongly. You know, I've said in an interview, she's like me, you know, I'm an outsider. I'm a fish out of two waters. I come from the 1% in the Caribbean, but when I come to the UK, I'm not really. English white, you know, I don't part, I pass as white, but my consciousness is post colonial or colonial consciousness. So I've always related to the mermaid, you know, she's out, she's stuck, she's between two things, yeah. And she's also quite revolutionary. She has a, she has an impact um, on the lives of the people she meets, you know, she gets people together who wouldn't, who've stayed apart for too long. Uh... The some of the ideas, um, and and um, I'm wondering uh, if we're going to take questions shortly after this. So, this will be my last question for the moment. And if yes. we have any questions, so do we you have, have about ten minutes left in the session, so you can take Q and A whenever you all are ready. Uh, do we have questions? Okay. Not yet, but this is a good reminder for people to put their questions in the in the question box, or you can put it in the chat box as well. Yeah, um, do do ask your questions of Monique. But you know, Monique, one of the things that kind of struck me about this book is how tentacled, almost like an octopus, misogyny is um, uh, in the Caribbean right? And how it expresses itself, maybe like this everywhere, but since we're talking about the Caribbean. Mm. Um, and I remember when, a, a couple of years back when I used that word, it was like, well, we don't have this problem in the Caribbean. So misogyny is tentacled. It's all over the place. It's in the Caribbean, but it, it's almost also invisible. Um, every other word is used uh, uh, other than it. So I have two questions here. One is... The mermaid says, I afraid of man, but I afraid woman worse. Mm-hmm. Why do you think she says this? I mean, you you do not spare women 
in talking, go, you know, dealing with these issues of misogyny in the Caribbean? I think it's women who's cursed her. That's why she's scared of women, because she has an effect on men and she stirs up envy and jealousy. But then, of course, you have to look at the structure inside, you know, women competing for men. It's a patriarchal structure. Women are in that women, women um, have conditioned misogyny, too, as you know, you know, so women suffer from the the are also conditioned um, in, t in the patriarchal world. Um, when it comes to misogyny in the Caribbean, I have really, really think this is a big one because I've spoken to feminists at UWE in Trinidad and I'm like, so look, every woman I'm friendly with would consider herself a feminist and is a feminist and also is a scholarly feminist and has read feminism and you know knows how is art an articulated an articulate feminist, and and I said I said it, and I said it's just you, isn't it? There's not many of you in Trinidad, and she's like, yeah, there's not many of us. There's only you know like six of us or something, and I wonder whether um, Western feminism, in the past, has had limitations. It has excluded working class women. It has excluded black women. It has excluded trans women. It has. You know, obviously initially started out on the, you know, wanting to liberate women, but, you know, Betty Friedan, the feminine mystique when it started in America, this was a middle class white woman. The suffragettes were upper class white women, you know, campaigning in the working class East End. So feminism has had its limitations in the West. It has been exclusionary um, and it's not for everyone. And and yet, and yet, and yet, you know, there is matrifocal and matrilineal and matriarchies in the region. I would always associate, I would, I would think most Caribbean people, when they think of the, the, the social structures of the region, they see it as a you know, matriarchy upon matriarchy. And you never meet, really rarely meet weak Caribbean women. So I wonder whether there's a kind of implied understanding of strength. And um, and then there are bigger problems. There are bigger, you know, there are bigger fights that have been fought, um, such as obviously um, uh, in the injustice of colonization and enslavement, et cetera, et cetera. And a solidarity with black men who have been enslaved, who, who are descendants of the enslaved. So I would say many, um, I wonder about intersectionality. I wonder whether Western feminism just, it's just, it's seen as a colonial, it seemed like it's white. It's a white thing. So I am not a black feminist. So I would, I, I think, you know, for me, my job is to read black feminists and become truly intersectional and to be able to claim that I'm intersectional. You have to read what, what um, Bell Hooks is saying. In fact, I've got a great book by Bell Hooks who is incredibly compassionate about men. I mean, she writes a big love letter to men in one of her books. So it's a, it's a big puzzle for me. And as a white woman, you know, it's almost like it's very hard to have a voice in this. What about you? What are your thoughts? I think uh, whether women claim to be feminists or recognize feminism or not, feminism is... It lifts all boats, you know, whether you recognize it or not. It, 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 I think it was James Baldwin who said, we will not be truly free until the black woman is free. Um, mm -hmm. And so what feminism yeah. has done is it has lifted all boats. It has lifted boats and made available um, opportunities for women who are feminists and for women who are anti-feminist, <laughs> right? Um, so that's the great power um, of feminism or womanism. As mm. Some, you know. mm. My final question for you, Monique, is um, a two-part question as well. Um, in this book, you've given uh, voice to multiple people, but it is really told, it is really David Baptiste's story, and he's a mm. black man. Mm. Um, and David is a, a tender, compassionate, loving mm. uh, character. 
Um, I wonder if you would, because in your other work, in your fourth cup going works, if you would have a black woman narrate a story like that, and then you can just, um, we can finish up by you telling us what it is that you're working on now. Okay. So David Baptiste, again, I think, I think, uh, oh, I can hear myself on your, on your um, thing. I think there was a wish for me to write good men. So it's not just David, there's life. And I wanted um, the mermaid, I wanted to select or write a good lover for I, for the virgin. Um, I wanted a good man for her. So ba David is a good man. He also happens to be black. Um, of course, that's a huge leap. I am leaping across um, gender. I'm leaping across race and I'm leaping across class. So by all means, um, I am setting myself a really big challenge and a task. And uh, I also knew that at the time, um, but it didn't stop me. And I guess I know there's the juries out here about what um, white people can do and not do and who we can write about, but it's not completely out. It's not like, don't do this, this is wrong. I think there's a mixed, there's a mixed conversation about, about writing what you don't know, but I do know that people should take care you need to do your research. You need to think about it. You need to find voice. You need to find character. You need to do character work. So none of this was done uh, in, in lightly. No, it wasn't done lightly. Um, I think I, I, I mean, and I also knew that I would get it. I knew I'd get, I'd get, I'd get it if I got him wrong. And so far, so good. So, you know, he's a lover. He's a good man. I, I just want to say that one person uh was saying that she she really appreciated what you were saying she's a jamaican white um and a writer as well i her comments seem to have disappeared um but i just wanted you to to note that oh, you. we do have a couple questions in the q a so i can we have enough I time to probably... okay why don't you go ahead and ask monique the questions in the q a okay so we have about um you know two minutes uh the first one is, did you ever conceptualize an ending to the story where the curse would, would be or could be lifted? No, I didn't. No, I knew, I knew, I knew she would go back to the sea. And it's, it's actually a bittersweet ending because I believe she's, she's beaten the curse, but she still goes back. So she beats the curse, but she, and she goes back different. Yeah. Okay, we can get another one in. Okay. Were there any early post-colonial Caribbean writers that influenced you to become a writer? Oh, many, 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 too many. Um, Rhys, Naipaul, um, Selvon, Lamming, you know, you, uh, so many, so many people um, I've been reading. Um, Sham Wazow, um, just everybody, really. We all read each other. And then um, so many people. And um, what's his name? James Baldwin. It's like I'm passionate about him. I love him, and he's so amazing. He he had a, a white mother, uh, and he could never hate white people. And he, I, another country is one of the best books I've ever read. I, I look at that book again and again, and it's and it's so intersectional and written when there was still a race bar. I just you know James Baldwin basically is someone who gave me permission to sort of like go forward. Okay. And then yeah. I think, this I think you'd be quite surprised <laughs> hearing me say that too. Yeah. All right. I think this is the last one because I think you read the one already, Jacqueline. But um, the, the last one is, do you think your early education and life in the West Indies juxtaposed against presumably the dearth of Caribbean literature during the 1980s and 90s in the UK and US uh, educational institutions gave you the resilience to hone your craft? Ooh, my education and so... There was there a dearth in the 80s and 90s? I'm not sure. Uh, I, oh, that's a strange question. Um, resilience, keeping at it. When you're a young writer, um, you're less experienced and you don't really quite know what you're up against. Um, and then you find out and then you gain resilience and you keep going anyway. I've always... Um, yeah, every time there's been a setback, I've just regrouped and gone forward. But I, I, I definitely know that I'm a Caribbean woman. 
there's no one can shake that or or take that away from me and so that does give me um everything i need really to go forward yeah. Uh, th thank you so much, Monique. We didn't get to talk about what's coming next, but we look forward to it. And I just want to recognize that la yesterday we lost, of course, George Lanning. Yes, we did. Thank yeah. You so much. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Thank you both. That was great. Um, and also, you can put whatever's coming next in the chat if you want to, just to let everyone know. Um, okay, and yeah, thank you both so much. Um, our next presentation will be in about five minutes. Uh, in the meantime, you'll get a survey after this presentation ends. Um, so if you can please go ahead and fill that out, that would be great. And um, thank you both again. Okay. Pleasure. Take Pleasure. Care. Bye, Jacqueline. Bye, Monique. Bye, love. Bye, 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 bye. How do we get out of here? Help. <laughs>